From Nashville's WSM Radio, the original home of the Grand Ole Opry, this is a Coffee, Country, and Cody podcast. Hey, it's Charlie Matos, and in this episode of our Coffee, Country, and Cody podcast, we sit down with John Ford Coley. John had been a guest with us in the past, but it had been a while since he'd been in studio. And what a wonderful occasion, his grand old Opry debut the very next day after our in-studio visit. He would debut on November the 12th of 2022. And uh, boy, England Dan and John Ford Coley, what the soundtrack to so many of our lives. Uh, I really love to see it tonight. Uh, sad to belong. Nights are forever without you. Love is the answer. So many great songs and so many wonderful memories and stories. Enjoy our Coffee, Country, and Cody podcast with John Ford Coley. Coffee, Country, and Cody on WSM. Hey, good morning at 8.33, 27 minutes till 9 o'clock. And, uh... We should show all this lovey-dovey madness that goes on with pictures Mm. and loving up on each other and kissing up on each other when we transition from somebody like T.G. Shepard and Kelly Lang to John Ford Coley, who just sat down. We're all getting pictures, and you guys hadn't seen each other in a while. Yeah. And renewing your friendship. Welcome back to Coffee Country and Cody Great to be here. Great to be here. We noticed T.G. didn't come in to say hi to us, came in to say right. hi to John. <laughs> yeah, I took a picture with John and Ford Cole. left. That's right. And let's see, look, I got, I'm working on my radio show. You know, yeah. I'm, a, yes, I'm a big radio star on Sirius XM. I have things uh, to yes, do. Right, uh, I've been out doing show prep. Come check me out when I'm on my way down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love that. Well, mister, you're making your grand old Opry debut. That is so cool. In a career that started in 19... Yeah. Fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. I think you're exactly... You're on it, man. Yeah. You got it. I think, I think Moses had just come down from Mount Sinai when I started doing this. So, yeah. so early 70s? Early 70s. Actually, uh, the late 60s. We jumped into this thing. I was about 15 years old, and Dan and I started playing together. And we were in high school together. I, he did not want me in the band. They, they had a guitar player that quit. And so everybody wanted a p- piano player, but Dan wanted another guitar player. Well, I get the job. Dan doesn't like me. We don't talk, you know. But then we, we'd drive along in the car going to gigs, started singing Everly Brothers songs and, and Righteous Brothers, things like that. Just kind of discovered we had a natural blend, and it just kind of took off from there. Now, he had moved, his family, I guess, had moved from West Texas, McCamey, uh-huh. out in the oil patch, right. to Dallas. He was in point. Dallas. As a matter of fact, he spent a time in Albuquerque as well. So, uh, yeah, but he was in high school uh, with me. He was a year before. All the guys in the band were a year before me. And his brother is Jimmy, Jimmy Seals, Seals of right. Seals and Crofts. And he just passed away recently. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brady Seals is related. He's related, right. Troy Seals is related. Right. Johnny Eddie's Duncan is related on his mother's side, as right. I recall. And, John, his... and uh, Eddie Seals. So... I mean, yeah, they they had quite a prolific family there, you know, and it's really sad. I think that they could have gone a lot further, uh, even as a family, and if they hadn't done country music and had decided to do Lithuanian disco polkas instead. I think I can see it now, man. They they would have they had a career. So. That lane is wide open. Absolutely. <laughs> so, what was the first thing that you put out together that you went? this is really resonating with other people. Like you're singing together in the car and you hear right. it. When did other people start to recognize it? Uh, actually, we ended up going on A&M Records because we had, uh, we started playing just a solo thing, you know, the mm. the, the duo deal. Okay. So we're playing at clubs, Rubiot, doing the folk stuff. Uh, we had had some records as the group, Southwest FOB, uh, back in Texas, but I mean, it really, it really took off on "Really Love to See You Tonight." We we had a we had a number one song in Japan uh, about 1972. So we toured with Three Dog Night for about two <laughs> weeks in Japan. That was great. I loved. That. What was the song? So it was called Simone. Really, it was the number one song. Yeah, and so, so we got over there, and they've got all of these these uh, people that are there, and they're they're waving at us and stuff. We thought, well, that's. How nice is that? You know, then all of a sudden posters start going up and we go, 
Oh, let's just go home. Oh, yeah, I don't like this all of a sudden, you know. So I mean, we, we had the best time over there. Southwest FOB stood for Freight on Board. Freight on Board. It is, yeah. So what's that a reference to? Was Actually, that a transportation w- w- company or? Yeah, you know what? I never, we, we always used SOB instead. You know, <laughs> and you would, well, you do it. I was wondering. Yeah, yeah they, they, they kind of frowned upon that. So uh, did you know Ray Wiley Hubbard, Michael Martin Murphy, those absolutely. other cats that were a part of that Dallas high school We, we all scene? played together at a place called the Rubiot. Uh, B.W. Stevenson used to come to my house and sleep in California. And as a matter of fact, I, one of the best stories about B.W. is that I get a call early in the morning. B.W. is sleeping on the couch. Mickey Raphael, who went on to play a harmonica for Willie Nelson, all those guys, he's sleeping in another spot. So the phone rings. I pick it up real quick, and this big, deep voice says, is, uh, is B.W. there? And I said, yeah, you know what, though? He's sleeping right now. Would you mind me if I just took your name and, and number and have him give you a call back? And he goes, oh, okay. He says, just, just tell him Steve McQueen called. And I went, tell you what, let me wake him up. <laughs> so, and I'm telling people back home, yeah, you know, Steve McQueen's calling my house and stuff. <laughs> It's just, you know, I just kind of fit in real quick. So, England Dan. Am I right that Jimmy, Dan's brother, gave him that name? He did. He he became all things Beatles as a West Texas kid. He fell in love with him, started using a British accent and the whole bit. Right. Dan, Dan, if you've ever heard a Texan try to mimic anything other than a Southern accent, (laughs) you know, you... I mean, but it was comical. As a matter of fact, Jimmy was responsible for that name, England Dan or John Ford Coley. I'd always heard about the England Dan part anyway. Yep. Wow. And you guys, you guys wrote so many of of the songs on, especially on so many of the early albums. On the early albums, we did. I think I sold like a dollar ninety eight on the stuff that we had. (laughs) But it was really funny because when they did really love to see you tonight, Mm -hmm. we didn't want to do it. Thought it was kind of a feminine song, really. And so they said, "No, come on, just just do it." So we did it, and it was really funny because I learned at that point how mercenary I could become. Again, I hadn't sold any (laughs) any real records. I saw the first check on really love to see you tonight i called up the writer and Par- i found parker, my, McGee, parker right? mcgee yep. i found myself going parker hey buddy <laughs> you know what else you got so <laughs> what was the first check do you recall it was in ninety six thousand dollars wow and now now it's, i've got a picture and actually i've got the actual check on my wall that i got it's first check from bmi a whopping 54 cents i've got it on my wall nice. <laughs> and, and bmi is messed up because they're 54 cents off on your accounting <laughs> so. but for your struggling singer songwriters it gets better oh absolutely <laughs> it, it does you know you, you go up to a dollar 98 like i said <laughs> So you you signed to A and M. Did Herb Alpert did he sign? Actually, Herb Alpert was because that's his label. That was his label. He's, he's and half the A and M. Louis Shelton was part of the Wrecking Crew, so he wanted to branch out and he wanted to start producing. So Jimmy Seals gave him us. He came to see us. He sends our tape to Herb Alpert. And he says it's kind of a cross between the Bee Gees, the early Bee Gees, and uh, Simon Garfunkel. And Herb says, "Well, I don't, I don't know." You know, he says, "Listen to the tape." So the story goes: is Herb is shaving. He wipes. He's listening to the tape. He wipes the shaving cream off his face. Calls Louie and says, "Get him out here." And that was. And I loved Herb Alpert. That guy between him and Dick Clark, I don't think you could find two better people. Mm-hmm. I just, I just had such admiration for those two guys. The Grand Ole Opry has always been a part of your life, even back to your childhood. I well, you know, as you why? get ready to debut, you know why? Now, not only was the music great, but every time I would go back through Dallas, I would have my aunt, because I, I always stop and see them. They go, so Johnny, did you see your cousin? I go, no, I did not. I, I, didn't, I didn't meet her yet. That was Minnie Pearl. Hmm. She was Sarah Ophelia Collie Buchanan. That's my distant relative. And I would have loved to have met her because I've heard absolutely great things about her. So that was my association to the Grand Ole Opry as a kid growing up, and I didn't really, you know, realize it. Wow, I had no idea it was familial. Did you? Wow, no. And you, that's the picture. Every time that I walk in, I look up yeah. at her and just Now, her. they were telling me the last time we were at the Ryman that she is the only one in the Country Music Hall of Fame that does not have a death date 
on her picture and, and her information because she said, well, Seraphiri Kali will, Buchanan will pass away, but Minnie Pearl will never die. And I went, that's wow. so cool, well, you know. Incredible. Jeez. The family tradition is intact with your appearance at the Grand Ole Absolutely. Opry this Saturday night. Uh, what are we rolling, Charlie, from the England Day and John Ford Cody Well, we Club? referenced Parker McGee. Let's uh, yeah. let's feature that one. What do you All think? right. Yeah. Songs of England Dan and John Ford Coley. John Ford Coley is in studio with us this morning, debuting at the Grand Ole Opry this weekend on Saturday. You'll be with him on Saturday, Charlie. I know. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be a great night. So what brought about the split? Was it 1980? I'm sorry. When, when the duo, when you guys finally called the duo oh, quits. The thing is, is that at a certain point, you've gone about as far as you're going to go. And it kind of starts to work against you. We were also fighting the disco uh, thing. Uh, we had people that were getting involved in our career that should not have gotten involved in the career. So they kind of split things up. Um but, I mean, Dan, he went on. He did a great uh, country career. Uh, I went into music and film uh, as an actor as well. So we just kind of branched out more or less. But it's like if you're going to end, Love is the Answer was really the last song. Mm-hmm. thought, let's end on top. Let's did you remain top. friends? Uh, not for a while. We had a tough split. And then later on, we got to be friends again. And when Dan passed away, it was just it was just Danny and John again, you know. Mm-hmm. So I don't have any issues with Dan at all. It was just we we're just Dan and John. He had uh, lymphoma, correct? A form of lymphoma, right? Uh, how long? I'm trying to remember. I I, I, I mean, certainly remember this passing, but it seems mm-hmm. like it was not a particularly long period of time. No, after it was he about was, two years. Was okay. Yeah, couple he had of, for about two years. And he he tried. They tried some aggressive treatments. He went him. to MD Anderson in Houston, I, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah, sure did. Uh, he was 61 when he passed. He was 61. That's really young, you know. When you hear, like, the body of work that you had mm-hmm. together, is there a song that you almost cut that you didn't and you wish you would have? Uh, gosh, yeah. Amy Holland got it. I can't think of the name of it. Michael McDonald's wife. Oh. And uh, we almost cut it, but, you know. I, I think our uh, our brains weren't working that particular day or something. <laughs> it's always fun to think about, hmm, what would have that sounded like if it was something that we would have done? Well, the one in. that got me was Love is the Answer, because, again, I swore up and down that Todd Rundgren snuck into my dream somewhere and stole that song from me. It's, it's, it's like, no, man, I wrote that song. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, but there, there was a lot of songs that they thought about putting out. One that actually uh, got a, a significant amount of play, and I still get requested for all the time for it, is Soldier in the Rain. Now, that was a semi-classical song. And, uh, I mean, it it's, was one that I wish that they had released. Mm. So how do you both wind up in Nashville? Well, Dan actually came first. Okay. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you want me to tell you the real story? Yes, absolutely. That's what we're hoping you know for. what? I'm, I'm old now and I don't really care anymore. <laughs> so I was putting a lot of songs and films and it better dried up. And so I'm thinking about, well, what, I'm coming back here. I'm doing Tin Pan South. I'm really enjoying that. Uh, Dan's already here. So I went in one day to show a guy some songs over at Paramount. And he looked at me, and I could tell something was just a little bit off. And he said, John, he said, I'm going to be really upfront with you. He says, I like your music, man. He says, you've got a lot of melodic songs here and stuff. And he said, you got one problem. And I said, okay, what is that? (laughs) And he said, you're the wrong age, and you're the wrong color. And I went, that's what I've needed to hear. And we sold the house, and I was gone move back here you know because again i really enjoyed back here uh i i really living in los angeles i thought that it would be kind of a nice change to be able to come back and speak my own language you know just for the heck of it because again nobody in in los angeles is fluent in redneck at all so i'm you know i'm real i'm i'm fluent in redneck so i came back here and could understand people we even write our road signs in redneck down there. <laughs> when we got here we pulled into a shoney's and my and my wife orders you know some drinks for the kids and the little waitress looks at her and she goes well does that have to with those and my wife said i'm sorry what 
And the lady said, would you like to have some of those? And my wife helplessly looked at me, and I looked at the lady, and I said, yes, ma'am, that would be nice. Thank you. And so she goes off, and my wife's got this, you know, no blood in her face, and she goes, what did she say? And I said, lids, dear. Would you like to have some lids with those? Believe me, I speak the language down here. Trust me. Fluent. <laughs> well, after your Grand Ole Opry debut, again, congratulations Thank on you that. Very much. I mean, that is, and you said seeing names like John Conley and Bill Anderson really yeah. spoke to you emotionally, too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that. you know, you, you think about the number of people that have come through there. Good Lord. And you're sharing the same stage with them. What, what, what an honor that is. And in the next few days in November, the church studio in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Bonita Springs, Florida at the Kick in the Blues Music Festival. In fact, the first hour on Saturday night will be Connie Smith, Bill Anderson, John Ford Coley, and John Conley. That's a pretty strong first hour of a Grand Ole Opry show, right? <laughs> is Nights of Forever original? No, actually, Parker McGee. That was Parker. The Parker okay, that was the one that I that I called him on. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what else you got? <laughs> Thanks for coming to see us. Thank you. Great to renew the friendship this morning. Thanks for listening to the Coffee Country and Cody podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode, and please leave us a five star review. This podcast was produced through the facilities of WSM Radio in Nashville, Tennessee. The hosts of Coffee Country and Cody are Bill Cody, Charlie Matos, and Kelly Sutton. Producer Eric Markham, WSM General Manager and Director of Content and Programming J. Patrick Tittle. Copyright 2022, Opry Entertainment Group Holdings LLC.